Good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar from HLB. Today we will be talking about the latest tax treaty developments and we will be starting with my colleague Chris Yandorf from HLB Germany and he will be going through the presentation. Thank you and please let us know if you have any questions by raising them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, uh, a very warm welcome wherever you are in the world and following our webinar. <clears throat> As Helen said, my name is Chris Jandorf. I'm from Germany and hosting this session today. And the audience may use the chat function to communicate questions or comments to the panelists. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars which the International Tax Committee of HLB sets up on a monthly basis. And today we deal with tax treaties. Our frame is one hour, and I hope we can discuss all relevant topics. Tax treaties are the melting pot of international taxation in terms of avoiding double taxation. Double tax treaties have a remarkable development. Today, there are more than 3,000 double tax treaties worldwide, which apply to taxpayers in conjunction with their respective national tax laws. Germany, for, for example, has concluded more than 90 arrangements in this field, and this, make, this is making it one of the countries with the most double tax treaties. What is the reason for that success story? There is an unanimous view among countries worldwide that international double taxation is harmful to, be economic, to the economic development of countries. Depending on whether states give economic policy preference to export neutrality or import neutrality, double, tax, double taxation of corporate profits is to be avoided either by credit method or exemption method. This is the good side and the reason for the success story. Policies, policies focusing on the avoidance of double taxation, however, have undergone relevant changes in the past 10 years. The basic understanding of the OECD countries has changed. Double tax treaties should now also avoid double non-taxation, let's say the opposite. The, change we will the changes we will discuss today are to be seen in the context of this new philosophy. Before we go into details, I would like to introduce our today's panel and speakers. I start with Aaron Boyer. Hi, Aaron. I hope you have already enjoyed your morning coffee. Aaron is sitting in Minnesota, a local time, 10 minutes past seven. Aaron, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Bright and early. Aaron is a certified public accountant and senior manager at Eight Bellies Tax Department, which is located in Minnesota, or better say, one of the tax departments is located in Minnesota, it's a huge company that has more than one tax department at uh, several locations in the United States. Aaron is a practitioner of international tax law. He helps US clients doing business abroad and non-US clients doing business in the US. He's a sought after conversation partner and speaker for international tax topics. I'm happy to see you on the panel, and I'm looking forward to hearing your insights of relevant developments in the United States. The next panelist is my colleague Til Zech from Germany. He is not on board yet. He will come a little bit later because he's stuck in another meeting. So nevertheless, this does not hinder me to introduce him to you. Till is a professor of tax law at Brunswick European Law School. Ah, now he has switched on. Hello, Till. I'm just about to introduce you. 
to the audience. Till studied in Germany, Netherlands and the United States, so he is a real international cosmopolitan. He earned his PhD at Muncie University with a dissertation on the taxation of transfer pricing and business restructuring. So again, an international tax topic. And uh, uh, he is admitted to New York Bar. So an excellent, he has excellent knowledge about the United States as a country and about the legal system. Besides that, he is a German Steuerberater, which means tax advisor, a certified tax advisor, uh, if you want. And he started his career as a lawyer. And then he changed the side and went to the tax authorities. And there he climbed very fast the ladder up to the general federal ministry of finance, where he was the responsible lecture, lecturer for international tax law. And now for about 10 years, he changed again his, and is now professor at what I mentioned, Brunswick International uh, uh, Law School. Well, and uh, he uh, publishes articles on international taxation and delivers speeches and so on. So he is in Germany uh, very well known. Hello, Till, and thanks that you are on board today. Hi to everybody. Hello. Our next speaker is my friend Nick from the United Kingdom. Nick is located near London. Good afternoon, Nick. How things are going in the UK today? Okay, he has been a tax partner at Menses since 2002 and has specialized in taxation for 20 years. Nick is qualified as chartered accountant and chartered tax advisor. Throughout his career, he has been focused on advising companies and their shareholders on the full range of strategic planning issues. Nick advises on both domestic and international tax issues. Nick never wants me to mention, but I always do. Nick is a prize winner in 2007. He wins an academic award, uh, which is um, the edit exams reward, which has something to do with international taxation. The next speaker was supposed to be on the panel today, which is Surabi Banzal. She comes from India and therefore is dedicated to deliver value to the treaty discussion, taking into account that India is a key partner of the OECD, but not a member. As we all know, treaty interpretation is very much dominated by the view of the OECD model and the OECD model commentary. My practical experience shows, however, that India is self-confident with the interpretation of tax treaty rules that may differ quite a lot from the Western understanding. For instance, permanent establishment requirements or more general source rules as such. For that, it's a pity that Surabi had to cancel her participation on the panel for personal reasons. I promise we will see her on one of our next webinars. And last not least, uh, myself. Uh, yes, I'm Chris Yanov, as you have already heard, and I'm your moderator today. Uh, I'm a tax lawyer and partner at HLB Schumacher in Münster, Germany. I'm responsible there for international taxation. And I'm also professor of law at Münster University. And the focus of my lectures is the taxation of businesses. And I'm happy to be your moderator today. So, Helen, if you make... Uh, yes, thank you. So, these are the topics for today. We will have, or I will give you a short introduction on the restructuring of treaty network. Then we we'll switch over to selected US treaty issues. Then we take a look at Brexit impact on treaties and a very relevant discussion today, the impact of COVID. 
This is combined with a case study and uh, the rest of the time to will give us a introduction of the relevant aspects of the new legal instrument, the so-called MLI, the multilateral instrument. And having all done this, I think the hour that we have will be over. Helen, next please. The process of restructuring the treaty network started about 10 years ago when states formulated ideas about anti-tax base erosion and anti-profit shifting, which has been named later as anti-BEPS actions. This was mainly driven by aggressive tax structures based on passive income boxes located in low tax jurisdictions. In my perception, large American corporations played a central role in this process. Yeah, we can discuss this maybe in between. Um, economic activity is becoming increasingly international, of course, and multinational corporations, as well as individuals, invest and engage in financing transactions and on a cross border basis. Taxpayers adapted to the existing double tax treaty network and the benefits from it, they get used to it especially through the use of corporations and double tax treaties can be used to obtain treaty advantages what we call treaty shopping therefore it is clear that the interpretation of double tax treaties is of great importance and is becoming more complex with increasing internationalization if tax treaty terms are interpreted differently by states double taxation or even non-taxation can occur due to unintended exemption for instance the discussion of the interpretation of the beneficial owner or the discussion on the differentiation between service versus royalties the uniform interpretation of treaties is important for the legal and planning security of the tax player on the one hand and the tax authorities on the other hand with regard to securing tax revenues. The interpretation is often based on the model commentary prepared by the OECD, which is not a real legal body and has not the power to set rules. But with such a, let's say, artificial legislation through model arrangements and model commentary the OECD has become an indispensable part of tax law however the basis for the use of the model commentary is very controversial in this context Surabi's insight from the standpoint of India would have been quite interesting the OECD tax committee itself assumes that the model convention and the commentary is of great importance for the interpretation despite it's legally not binding overall it can be observed that countermeasures are also being coordinated more intensively internationally in response to international structural opportunities in tax law in the foreground especially in recent years is the work of the oecd after the practice of using low taxation as a location factor and shifting profits while avoiding tax revenues came under increasing criticism following the 2008 financial crisis the g20 put the fight against base erosion and profit shifting we name it BEPS, and on the agenda and commissioned the OECD to draw up the action plan with priority measures. The OECD presented this action plan within 15 points in February 2013 and developed recommendations for action on each of these in record time by the end of 2015. The recommendations were implemented in the usual manner in the latest update 
of the OECD model agreement and model commentary of 21 of November 2017. What is new here are the instruments used. Most important change in treaty politics is the restructuring of the treaty network by BEPS actions. We can distinguish pre-BEPS treaties and post-BEPS treaties. The anti-BEPS action, actions involve a number of modifications and treaties. Intended to neutralize the effects of hybrid mismatches to prevent the granting of treaty benefits in inappropriate circumstances, to prevent artificial avoidance of permanent establishments or to improve the resolution of international tax disputes. These actions are all incorporated in the 2017 OECD model tax convention and the commentaries. In order to ensure, tec technically speaking, a correspondingly rapid applicability, the OECD has additionally developed the multilateral instrument that introduces the consented BEP standard by the OECD by overwriting existing double tax treaty as of January, 1st January 2019, if states have signed and ratified this multilateral treatment. This MLI topic will be part of our webinar today and the last point today, Till will uh, bring us the relevant aspects of this new thing. So I would like to start now with some selected US treaty issues. And so this is the part of Aaron. Um, Aaron, you told me that in March of 2021, that's about a uh, month ago, YouTube indicated they would start withholding 30% tax income earned by foreign persons. The withholding applies to earnings from viewers in the US from AdViews, YouTube Premium, Super Chat, Super Stickers, Channel Memberships. Questions about this. Is it up to a big company to change tax policy? Is this a significant change in the US? Or how does this affect other US companies that are similar to YouTube? And what is the practical impact? Is this about the discussion, maybe what I initially mentioned, service against uh, uh, license? So can you give us maybe a short um, insight of your ideas to this topic? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're really familiar, Chris, with the Super Chat and the Super Stickers from YouTube. <laughs> um, some of these revenue generating items from YouTube are they're new to me, but um, it's really interesting that on the US side, we've kind of had this, I don't know if a debate, but maybe just uncertainty over the last few years um, as technology has developed in the US over what is a service and what is a royalty. Um, and that usually takes analysis on the US side. And the challenge has been that the regulations that the IRS or the Treasury Department have written, um, they're relevant more towards like book sales, um, classical types of copyrighted items. And it's hard to fit technology that we have today in some of those older regulations. And in 2017, the IRS, or 2019, I should say, the IRS came out with uh, proposed regulations. They're just proposed, they're not final. Um, but they attempt to kind of classify some types of income, particularly related to like SAS, and determine whether it's a royalty or whether it's a service. Um, and so we've been looking at those regulations and the whole industry in the US and trying to figure out, okay, well, what really is a service and what's a royalty? Um, 
the significance of a company the size of Google, uh, you know, and, and YouTube being such a largely viewed platform coming out and saying in March that um, they're going to start treating the income earned by foreign creators uh, as royalty income um, rather than service income. And from a U.S. tax perspective, U.S. would typically only tax a foreign creator's service income if, that, if those services are performed in the U.S. And in a lot of cases, I think the argument would be, well, if uh, the income that's being generated from YouTube is a service uh, and that is being created outside the U.S., then that's not subject to U.S. taxation and not subject to treaties either. It's just by statute in the U.S. If it's a royalty and if that royalty is being used in the U.S. or is being exploited in the U.S., then that's considered U.S. source income. And the general rule is that the U.S. would withhold the, the U.S. company that's remitting the payment would withhold 30% tax. So the fact that YouTube, as large as it is, has come out and said, we're going to call this income royalty income, and we're going to withhold 30% unless we can receive, unless the foreign creator or the person that's uh, receiving the income, unless they provide documentation to indicate that they're eligible for treaty benefits, um, is a really significant shift. And although that Came, that news came out in, in March, the implementation date appears to be the end of May, beginning of June. And we've already been discussing with other clients um, implementing the same process. So your question is interesting, Chris, can a company as large as Google or, or, or like YouTube, can they create tax policy? Um, obviously they gave it a lot of thought. We're not sure what kind of triggered that, uh, whether it was an audit with the IRS uh, or whether it was a financial statement issue for a potential liability of withholding tax, we don't know. But what we can say is that there are a lot of other companies that are in a similar industry that are doing the same, and it's going to potentially affect quite a few um, foreign uh, content creators. Thank you, Aaron. Any comments from? Nick Till, how is it in Germany, in the UK? Do we have the same controversial issue? I think it's more or less a little bit the same in Germany, at least, where we have the problems if a German licensee um, uh, pays out to a foreign licensor. And there the uh, treaty benefit of a zero tax rate on royalties is uh, override by German local law with uh, sub, uh, substance rules. And so this is, um, yeah, a quite of, uh, it's a part of the tax structuring to say, okay, I don't pay for a license, so the costs are not a royalty. I pay for a service, so the cost is a service fee, with the different tax implications uh, that you mentioned. So, in principle, we have the same point uh, in German tax practice as well. But maybe not in the, uh, let's say, the dimension is uh, uh, very much different. So. Uh, I understand that it's uh, for the United States, it's a uh, very, very important info budgetary aspect. So it's uh, uh, you cannot compare the uh, 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 budgetary effects between Germany and the United States. That's uh, clear, I think. Sure. Well, I think one thing it'll definitely be, it'll definitely do in the US is it's going to accelerate the discussion. Um, because now it's so prominent with a, a, you know such a large company. Um, I think it kind of forces the US, whether those are, that's the authorities or the industries, to kind of come up with uh, some conclusions about how that type of income should be classified uh, and ultimately taxed. All right. Are there any more remarks from the panel to this point? Um, Chris, hi, it's Nick here um, from the UK. I think this is a constant theme that we're we're seeing this kind of 
treaty interpretation what is the form of the uh, payment does it fall under that royalties provision or does it fall under the uh, um, provision of services and from a UK perspective that's absolutely crucial because if it's a uh, a royalty we have a domestic withholding tax rate of 20 percent which may be reduced under a tax treaty but if it's services there wouldn't be any withholding tax um, and you can see the difference there if you continue to um, uh, um, treat the the payment in, in one form or the other and that endures for a period of time um, if it perhaps should have been classified as a royalty and withholding tax um, uh, paid in the UK then you know that can get quite significant over time. So I think the the uh, advisory point here is that companies have to look very closely at the form of their payment and be quite sure as to how it would be classified in a particular jurisdiction. And as Aaron's saying, um, there is starting to be some developments here. And I think there will be um, a number of tax authorities looking at what's happening here in the US. And you know, obviously, uh, at developments in one um, country do sort of impact on how things may be viewed in another. So um, it's, it's a bit of watch this space, but it will, it's, it is a very uh, relevant um, point and something that companies need to be very clear about um, to make sure that they've done their analysis of how they think a, a payment should be treated. Well, there's also advisory risk. If you classify wrong for the benefit of the, the client and it turns out to be it's a royalty with, with and you should have paid with holding tax or your client should have paid then it's a liability aspect for both for the client and for the advisor so it's uh, yeah it's a crucial point which can have enormous consequences yeah and therefore um, it becomes more important yeah, that um, contracts are drafted very carefully because if you have clear contracts then it is much easier to argue against the tax administrations than if that point is unclear in the contracts yeah but it's easy to foresee which position the tax administration will take in an audit and um, yeah but I think, yeah, you can try to cover the risk by good contracts, but the, uh, uh, let's say the problem as such uh, uh, still is there. So, yeah, but very interesting point. And uh, uh, what's significant for me is that it's the company itself that uh, well, is doing, let's say, oh, I exaggerate a little bit, is doing the tax policy. Aaron, may I put another question? Um, a more general one, actually. Um, but it seems to me relevant because uh, this question is uh, put a lot of times. Um, the US taxation consists of federal and federal tax and state tax. So these are two different taxes and two different uh, authorities that, that levy the tax. And do the treaties apply to both federal and state income tax, or just one or the other? So this is always there's always a little uncertainty. In if you have a client with a U.S. connection, and so is there a clear answer? Yeah, well, there there is a clear answer in that. Tax treaties with the U.S. and foreign jurisdictions typically only cover federal tax rather than state tax. And of course, we have 50 states. Not all of them have uh, tax regimes, but um, most of them do. And so one of the challenges we see fairly frequently as advisors is that um, when companies are planning into the U.S., they look at the treaty and they say, oh, well, do I have a permanent establishment, for instance, um, or if I'm renting equipment in the U.S., um, do I have a 0% rate maybe under a treaty for rents? Um, and they may, they may get there from a federal perspective, but the state tax implications are still there and there's still potential that a state would tax the income. And it's, kind of, it's a completely separate analysis. Uh, states look at nexus rules 
for taxable presence. Treaties look at permanent establishment rules. And so I think it's just kind of something that gets overlooked. And one of the reasons why I thought it was worth mentioning is that when companies are doing analysis, although the state, I mean, the federal rate here is 21%, state rate is much less usually, um, looking at the five to probably 10% range. Um, so still something, um, but it's very common for companies just to kind of omit that step and say, well, if I'm not subject to federal tax, then I'm just not subject to tax in the US because the treaty applies, um, but still need to consider the treaty and not, or the, the state tax rules. And not only the state tax rules for, for income, but also if employees are being sent to the US, there are separate rules for whether the employees would be subject to state tax. Um, so they may be exempt from federal tax under the treaty, uh, but state taxes may still apply to uh, employees. And so definitely something, to include in the checklist when analyzing what the tax impact is for a company that's coming to the US. Yeah, I think it's a little bit confusing, uh, but it's the way it is. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing, but it's clear. Um, yeah, and that, that not only applies uh, obviously to income tax, but also obviously sales tax is something completely separate in the US, sales tax is administered by states, uh, and that's not covered under treaties. Typically, like in the EU, like VAT wouldn't be covered by a, a treaty as well. Can you explain us, in short words, the mechanism of the sales tax? What is tax? Is it a turnover, like more uh, comparable to the European VAT? Yeah, um, so in the, the VAT world, you guys typically go uh, collection, 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 and you know there's a refund process along the way, but typically you're collecting tax as values added um, to a product or service, whatever the case is. And ultimately the customer is the one that bears that, that full cost. Um, on the US side, we have something similar, except it works more like exemption, 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 and ultimately you get to a customer and then that customer is the one that, that bears the cost. So just from a mechanic standpoint, it's a timing difference in that uh, VAT usually has tax collected along the way. Sales tax is usually, there's no sales tax collected until there's a final consumer. Um, as far as that, as far as sales tax applying to to uh, US consumers, historically, the states have looked at Nexus, which is kind of looked at what do you have in that state? What activity do you have in that state? Physical Nexus, right? Um, but within the last few years, there's been a prominent case, the Wayfair case, which no doubt you've heard of, um, which basically said that even though in the state of South Dakota, a company didn't have any real physical activity there, the state can still assess sales tax and require that company to collect sales tax on uh, sales to customers in that state. So really looking at a jurisdiction uh, and a marketplace and saying, is a company, uh, are they selling into this company or into this state? And if so, uh, if they exceed a certain level of transactions or a dollar threshold, then that state can assess sales tax. And that affects foreign companies doing business in the US. Um, obviously, even though they may not have employees in the US, even though they may not actually have an inventory sitting in the US, everything may be shipped from a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, if they're exceeding those thresholds, then they can still be subject to sales tax, which means they would have to register and collect sales tax on their sales and remit that and just go through the administrative process. Okay, thank you. Uh, one information panel, we are still on slide number five. Um, maybe one last question. Um, in my thinking is, um, what, what I'm uh, about is uh, registration uh, in uh, uh, the United States. Generally, I, I say, okay, if you have a permanent uh, establishment, you have to register in any country in the world, I would say because then you are uh, uh, liable to the local uh, uh, corporation tax where the permanent establishment uh, is located. Um, 
I've heard that in the US, uh, you even have to register if there's an OPE. Is that a, uh, is it so? Or uh, um, can you give us clearance? Uh, or is it? Sure. Is it, oh. Yeah, well, the, I've noticed the same thing. Um, and it's kind of shocking to us in the US as tax, at least on my side as a tax advisor, when we're advising a US company and they have activity in, let's say, an EU country. And if we get to the position where we don't have a permanent establishment, the question is, well, do we still have to register? Do we still have to file? And it seems like the answer in a lot of cases is no, um, which to us is, is surprising because on the US side, if a company, um, specifically around PE, if a foreign company has activity in the US and they're claiming treaty benefits, um, typically, the U.S. still requires them to register and get a tax ID number and file a U.S. tax return, basically raising their hand and saying, I'm here and I'm claiming treaty benefits. Um, and that is kind of surprising for companies. I think it is a significant step that gets overlooked, uh, but it is, pretty, it is fairly critical for a couple of reasons. One, if uh, the treaty declaration or assertion is late, there is a potential penalty the IRS can assess. Uh, and secondly, if it turns out that they don't have a PE or they do have a PE, so they may have thought that they don't have a PE, so they never filed anything, and it turns out that they did have a, a permanent establishment, there's a rule in, in the U.S. that says if a foreign company doesn't file their U.S. tax return within 18 months of the filing deadline, then the IRS has the right to disallow deductions related to that income. So the potential disaster scenario is a company thinks that they have no PE under a treaty, they don't file a tax return. It turns out that they actually do have a PE and they have taxable income uh, in the US and the US then is allowed to disallow deductions related to that income. So they're, they're taxed at gross income uh, rather than net income, which is obviously disastrous for, uh, from a tax planning perspective. Or it's a tax penalty. Well, are there to the others? Are there further comments, questions to the US topics we have addressed? If it's not the case, I would go further to the UK and uh, ask Nick about uh, uh, the Brexit impact on tax treaties. Um, so, uh, let me start with a basic question, Nick, um, and this uh, question seems to be a little bit, let's say, um, a, a stupid for an expert, but I hear this question from time to time. Now the question, are UK tax treaties applicable after Brexit? So, <laughs> that you can explain to all uh, that are listening. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, and just to uh, comment around treaties and to provide some uh, sort of context here, um, the UK itself has a very wide tax treaty uh, network, um, tax treaties into about 130 countries, so it's very extensive. Um, having said that, there are actually some sort of uh, gaps which um, you know can can cause problems so for instance the UK has no tax treaty with Brazil um, which is is quite a key um, jurisdiction obviously um, the the tax treaties are constantly being um, updated and you know that's reflected in an ongoing um, uh, strategy from the tax authority so you know currently I think they're working on bringing one into place with Peru, where again, there is no tax treaty at the moment. And uh, some of the older tax treaties, such with, as with um, Sri Lanka and New Zealand, you know, those date, date back to the 80s, they're also being updated. Um, perhaps just to pick up on a point that Aaron made, and I think it's very relevant, um, tax treaties don't cover all taxes. Um, you know, they don't cover the VAT tax, the national insurance, the estate taxes, stamp taxes. They're only in relation to certain taxes, typically the direct taxes on capital gains, um, corporation tax, income tax, th those uh, taxes. And you'll find at the start of any tax treaty what taxes are actually 
covered by the uh, the treaty. Um, interestingly, uh, the UK has actually introduced a, a tax which they um, say falls outside of the tax treaty, which um, can tax overseas multinationals doing business in the UK, um, which means they don't get treaty protection. Uh, that particular tax came along in 2015, um, called the diverted profit tax. Um, and the rate of tax there is um, above general um, UK corporation tax rates. It's currently at 25% and also uh, forecast to go up to 31%. So not all taxes are covered by treaties and um, you know, countries uh, may introduce taxes which fall outside of uh, treaties. And we again may see this in, in relation to digital services and how uh, countries are, are looking to uh, tax that um, kind of income being made in their, their country. Um, and, and another point perhaps on tax treaties in the wider sort of um, sense is that not all tax treaties are what we would call full, ta full tax treaties. You have to look very closely at obviously what um, articles are included in a tax treaty. Um, and some of the tax treaties may omit uh, clauses or they may be written in a particular fashion which um, isn't consistent with um, those of other tax treaties. So for instance, if you look at the tax treaties the UK has with Jersey or with Hong Kong, they're not what we would call full tax treaties because they don't carry um, uh, the sufficient wording in, in, in the non-discrimination article of that tax treaty, uh, which means actually for something like transfer pricing, um, between those two jurisdictions, full transfer pricing will be required even if you're uh, a small company and um, uh, would otherwise be exempt if you uh, were dealing with a full treaty um, country. So always really important to look at the, the treaty itself and the terms of the, uh, the treaty, um, any specific articles that may be in there. Um, for instance, uh, treaties that the UK has with India, Malaysia, you know, they have particular service um, permanent establishment um, articles in them, uh, which you won't find in, in, in a lot of the uh, more recent um, tax treaties. So coming to your particular question, um, Chris, these tax treaties endure, um, they remain in place, um, they are now our main tool for doing business with um, countries in the EU. The UK has a full treaty network with all EU 27 um, countries. And, you know, th these are, you know, obviously uh, vital um, in order to uh, um, assess uh, where the tax should be being paid if um, uh, UK companies are doing business um, in the EU or vice versa, that um, you know, those EU companies are coming into the uh, UK. So the tax treaties, I think, you know, they do vary from country to country, but they are, you know, obviously, uh, crucial um, uh, tools. I think if you move on to the next slide here, um, one of the points which I, I wanted to really bring out was that when we left the EU um, at the start of this year, um, from a tax point of view, the treaties stayed in place, but what we lost were access to these EU directives. And I've listed some of the really relevant ones there, which um, do make a difference to companies or groups doing business um, across border. So it's the fact that these directives um, are now no longer available to UK uh, companies um, that can make a, a significant um, difference. And what this will typically mean, if you pick up the first two of those tax directives, the parent subsidiary directive and the interest and royalties directive, what this really means is that previously it may have been possible to have uh, payment flows where there'd be no withholding tax. Now we have to look under the terms of a particular tax treaty to see if um, withholding tax may arise or not. Um, so as in the past, it's likely that would have been no withholding tax, they'd have been eliminated by one of those directives. Now we have to look at the payments and look at the actual tax treaty to uh, determine whether withholding tax will apply. And if you just move on to the next slide, what I've tried to do here um, is just map down 
what those treaties are now provided in, providing in relation to, uh, to withholding tax. So to take an example, Chris, if you look at uh, UK, uh, Germany under the treaty there, um, the treaty rate on, uh, on dividend payments um, is actually 5%. Um, so previously, if uh, a UK company had a German subsidiary and it paid a dividend up to the UK, um, it should have been able to access um, the directive and eliminate uh, withholding tax. Now, that payment, a similar payment going up to the UK, um, under the treaty, um, the withholding tax there could be 5% or, or based on German domestic law, uh, may be lower, but, it, but certainly a 5% withholding tax is possible through the terms of that, that tax treaty. And we're starting to see this obviously arise across companies doing business in the uh, EU um, on any of these forms of payment, dividends, interest, royalties, uh, you know, important trading partners. Um, if you look at some of the countries there, for instance, Italy, um, you know, there's withholding tax on all of those forms of, uh, of payment um, that may be being made between those uh, um, territories. I guess one point just to, to mention is that from a UK perspective on outbound payments, we don't actually have any withholding tax on dividends. So there won't actually be any dividend withholding tax, but our domestic rate of withholding tax is uh, 20% on interest and royalties, um, unless reduced here under the terms of a, a tax treaty. Um, and to actually benefit from that, reduced uh, withholding tax, certainly for interest payments, you have to get that cleared with the uh, tax authority in advance. So there's actually quite a lot of um, uh, work to do around payment flows between UK and EU uh, uh, companies um, and making sure that um, you, know, you can benefit from the reduced uh, rates of withholding tax. And this is much more in point now, obviously, uh, that we've left the, uh, the EU. Um, so I think that's a fairly sort of um, clear sort of um, position that we're now looking at uh, the terms of a treaty and having to apply them um, for trade between the UK and any particular EU uh, country from a tax perspective. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, but what I want to say is the business within the EU for UK companies, now the treaties are even more relevant than before. Mm -hmm. So it's the only tool in order to reduce withholding taxes now. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, I think quite uh, important. Okay, so thank you very much, Nick. Um, for this insight um, or the, on the Brexit consequences. If I take a look at the watch, it's we have actually seven minutes left. This will mean that we could not cover all that we wanted. And uh, especially the topic MLI, which would absorb a lot of times uh i would like to move to a separate webinar if till doesn't mind no problem um, it's separate. if you don't shoot me afterwards till i would like to really to to uh, uh, shift it to a webinar let's say in some months because uh, the slides you deliver give enough uh, content for a whole hour so, but what I want no, to no do problem. Is it costs you speak up team, team. That's all. Is, is that okay for you too? No, it's okay. It costs you speak up team. That's all. <laughs> okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, but what I think is uh, important for today, it's because of the actuality of the topic, is the COVID impact on the treaty interpretation, and uh, as we see on the slide. Uh, the OECD was very fast in delivering guidelines on how to interpret uh, 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 treaty terms 
which are temporarily um, uh, affected by the movement obstacles and so on, restrictions on travel and so on, which means that taxpayers are located uh, in states where they don't want or usually are not are. So this is the point where, let's say, a home office becomes a permanent establishment uh, of a company or a construction site is interrupted because um, uh, 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 or due to travel obstacles and so on, all caused by the restrictions um, in order to uh, uh, um, prevent the rapid spread of the virus. And um, if you summarize in one sentence, the position of the OECD is that these temporary effects should not have implication on the interpretation of the terms. So meaning if uh, somebody concludes contracts from the home office, this should not become a PE of the company. Or um, frontier workers that stay more than 183 days in the other country, this will not um, uh, shift the, uh, uh, to the tax, uh, the right to tax to the other country. So uh, this is, I think, uh, um, uh, summarized in one sentence, but this is the position of the OECD. And all national states can um, take a different approach. For example, Germany is only um, regarding construction sites, they gave a guidance. The UK gave some guidance and the United States as well. Um, in this context, I would ask Nick to uh, deliver his insights because he has uh, uh, made a special analysis uh, regarding home office and permanent establishment. And maybe you could um, share your knowledge with us, Nick. So we'll yeah, go to the next slide and thanks, Chris. And if you just click through one more slide. Um, so the context obviously provided by Chris there that there has been, you know, through this um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of changes in the business models and locations from where um, employees are now working. Um, and with that, of course, comes this in increasing global tax risk um, from both a company uh, tax perspective as well as an employment um, tax perspective. Um, the OECD guidance is, is very useful and there have been countries that have provided some um, helpful insights as to how they would also interpret changes which are due specifically to um, the COVID-19 uh, um, restrictions. If you click through to the next slide, um, what I try to do on the, the next slide here is, is provide a, um, a sort of summary, I guess, of um, what is actually coming through in this OECD guidance, some of the key points that um, Chris has, has mentioned. Um, the OECD themselves, if you're looking at a home office and somebody working from home and whether that creates a business tax presence for the um, overseas uh, company, um, their um, commentary is around that place needing to have a certain degree of permanence um, and being regarded as being at the disposal of the uh, the enterprise if it's going to be a fixed place of business um, and you see that coming through in some of the country commentary there if you look at australia um, they're talking about employees tempor temporarily in australia um, who will sort of relocate as soon as possible and at that point you know effectively you haven't got that permanency and that fact that that home office is unlikely to be regarded as at the disposal of the um, overseas company. Australia, there, sorry, Austria, they're talking about 
um, provided the work in the home office um, does not become the norm. And I think this is possibly the risk area is that companies have now found that perhaps their staff can work from remote locations and they may um, stay there longer um, than just in relation to the um, uh, restrictions from the pandemic. And some of the comments there from, from Canada, for instance, they're talking about solely the fact that the employee is solely there as a result of the travel restrictions. And we're starting to perhaps get to a point where some of these travel restrictions may be lifted, that people can uh, travel for, for business um, purposes. And so companies will need to look at this and see whether um, their staff are just in a location temporarily or it's starting to become more of an intention that they may be there, based there permanently. I think Arlen make a good um, good point there about the maintenance of records, about the facts and the circumstances. And if people are looking to take advantage of the fact that, um, you know, they've got employees in a location, but it, it's not a uh, um, fixed place of business, um, putting some uh, documentation together to support that would be, uh, be useful. Um, just flipping back there to what the OECD are actually um, saying on this um, particular slide, um, they're talking about is the home office used on a continuous basis by the um, individual um, to the extent that if the um, employee um, uh, was um, working in that, that location, um, and were, weren't working from their home office, would they need to be provided with a, an alternative office by the business? If the answer to that is yes, that the home office has really become you know, uh, an alternative to providing them with a fixed office, that's where they would regard the home office as being at the disposal of the enterprise. Um, but the final bullet point there under the OECD is that they're saying if actually there was a um, an office available to them in another um, jurisdiction, um, but they just chosen to work um, from their from their home, then the fact that they're not actually being required to work there from the uh, business takes it away from being regarded as a um, permanent establishment. So I think there's some helpful commentary. Chris has obviously made the valid point that the OEC the commentary is just guidance, it's just their interpretation. It does provide some form of um, protection for, for businesses that um, uh, may find they've got dislocated employees in certain um, uh, jurisdictions where they wouldn't typically work. Um, but the longer that goes on um, and, and the more that the employees do through that home location, um, it is uh, certainly the risk uh, of it becoming a permanent establishment and pulling the overseas company into the, uh, the local tax net increases. And I think that's what companies now need to start looking at, um, you know, how long those employees have been there, what roles they perform. I think on the next slide, you'll find a, a summary actually of these, these points. These are the things which I think people need to now be looking at. What's the nature of the work that's being performed in that, that location? Um, is it just temporary or permanent? Are they being required to work from the home by the business or is it just through the uh, restrictions on travel by the um, uh, pandemic? How much time is being spent working at the home um, office? Um, what does the domestic law say? That will always be the key. Is, is the domestic law there um, Diff, slightly different from the way that the treaty may work between two jurisdictions and, and as, as mentioned earlier document those arrangements so I think this is, is, is a risk area and uh, something which uh, companies will need to keep a, a close eye on uh, the longer um, their staff are working uh, from a home office in another jurisdiction. Thank you Nick, wonderful summary. Um, I think we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, I'm very sorry that we have to drop the really interesting topic of the MLI. Um, but as I said before, we will move this to a 
different session. And so this topic is not lost. It's we just postpone it to a, a different date. So uh, I have to thank all participants and especially the panelists for their contribution here today. And uh, I think we got wonderful insights of new developments. And yes. Uh, Thank you very much and um, I hope to see you very soon physically, not only digitally. So stay healthy and bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.